Indeed, it's our pleasure to be here. And this morning, as we come to morning devotion, I just want to thank the Lord uh, for my wife. I am honeymoon happy. Amen. That my wife, Stephanie, is with me this morning and my children. I am proud of them and so glad that we can be with you. We've been feasting on the word of the Lord all week. And this morning, I want to take us to an old well to get some new water for our thirsty souls in Daniel chapter 3. And in Daniel chapter 3, I want for us to turn there to the Old Testament. I'm going to read just a few verses from Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 down through about 17. Amen, church? And as I read this in your hearing, we're going to read in the King James Version, Daniel chapter 3, verse 14. As I do, if you would allow me to pretend like I'm back in my church in Atlanta, Georgia, and ask you to stand to your feet for the reading of the Word, we do this not only in honor of the reading of the Word, but also so that you can wake up just in case you're still asleep. Amen. Daniel chapter 3, verse 14 down through 17, and it reads this way from the King James Version. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made, then well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Here's their answer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, O king, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I want to preach for just a few moments on the subject, things we lost in the fire. Let us pray. Now, Lord, if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need you now. So speak to your people, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The people of God suffer from many illnesses today that we should not suffer from. One of which is one of the greatest illnesses we suffer from, and that is spiritual amnesia. We seem to forget what God has done so quickly. As soon as we are blessed, we turn looking for the next blessing, forgetting to thank God for the blessings we already have. And oftentimes when we are blessed, we, we soon forget where our blessings come from, particularly those who have what I like to call premature faith, those who praise God before they understand what God has done. Nebuchadnezzar is such a one, for he has received a blessing from God through Daniel in Daniel chapter 2. You know the story. Daniel has properly interpreted the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar, in his, in his gratitude for what God has done, gives a premature praise in Daniel 2, 47 and 48, and calls Daniel's God the true God. But then in Daniel chapter 3, oh, how soon Nebuchadnezzar forgets how good God has been. For he erects a golden image in his own likeness. Now, the interpretation of the dream had nothing to do with Nebuchadnezzar erecting an image for his own self-worship. 
But Nebuchadnezzar received a blessing he did not understand, gave premature praise, and forgot where his blessings came from. Be careful that you do not forget who blessed you. Nebuchadnezzar erects this golden image, and the Bible sets the stage. Ah, Church of God, don't miss the context, for he invites all the powerful potentates and people of position and wealth and tells them, come, for I have erected a golden image in my image. And when the music is played, I need you to bow down. He gave them an ultimatum as a motivation for worship. He said, when the music plays, I want you to bow down. Now, please don't miss the context for, he says, if you do not bow down, there will be consequences. If you do not bow down, you will burn. So the ultimatum was bow or burn. The worship, watch this, the motivation for worship was fear. There are a lot of people who are still worshiping God out of fear. There are some people who worship God because they are afraid of going to hell. There are some people who do right because they are afraid of the consequences of doing wrong. But I hope you understand this morning that fear is never a reasonable motivation for worship. Neither is fear a sustainable motivation for worship. I remember when I was coming up, they used to sometimes scare me into doing right. They said, young man, if you go to the nightclub, the angels will stay on the outside. And when you go in there, they will wait till you come out. I understand it was a well-intentioned a motivation to scare me into doing right. But that is not what the Bible tells me. For the Bible says, if I make my bed in hell, he is there. If I ascend to the heights of heaven, he is there. If you just think about it, if the devil could ever get you into a place where you were all by yourself, he would kill you in an instant. But are there any people here who are glad that wherever you went, God God, by his mercy, kept you, and the only reason you are here is by the mercies of God. Ah, oh, fear is never a sustainable motivation for worship, for fear will wear off. Ah, they said, ah, uh, they said, you must bow or you burn. And when the music played, most of the people bowed down because watch this, they did not, they understood that if they didn't do what the king said, they would lose their lives. Stay with me, we're going somewhere. Their motivation was self-preservation. They did not want to lose what they thought they had to hold on by their own power. Uh, whenever you are motivated by self-preservation, you must understand that you will give in to compromise. And when you give in to compromise, you can never make God known. See, I'm right here in the theme. For you see, oftentimes when we think about making God known, we think about giving Bible studies. But may I suggest to you there's a different different way of witnessing that you can witness by simply not compromising when everybody else is compromising? Let me come a little bit closer. May I, may I suggest to you that you can make God known Seventh-day Adventist Church if our divorce rate was not the same as the world's? May I suggest to you that you could make God known, my brother, if you treated your wife with more respect than your people at work did? May I suggest, young people in the Adventist church, that you could make God known if you kept yourself sexually pure. We're always thinking that being peculiar means having a certain different kind of doctrine. No. Being peculiar means you actually live what the Word of God says. And people would know who we were if we simply did the will of God. Ah, oh, 
uh, everyone else bowed down. The music of compromise was playing, and everybody bowed down. Watch this. They bowed down because of fear of losing what they thought they got themselves. See, everybody who was on the plane, don't miss the context, were appointed by the king. So the reason why they bowed down is because they got their job from the king and they didn't want to lose their job from the king. But the reason why the three didn't bow down is because they knew they weren't there because of the king, Nebuchadnezzar. They were there because of the king of kings and lord of lords. Ah, Let me help you to understand that the way you get something is the way you have to keep something. Mm. Mm. See, if you got the job by lying, then you have to keep the job by lying. Mm. If you got your spouse by cheating and stealing from somebody else, it's the same thing you've got to do to keep them. But how many of you know when God gives you something, no devil can take it from you? Ah, so they stand now on faith. They will not capitulate. They will not give in. Everybody's knees bows, but these stand erect, and they stand out because they're standing on the Word of God. Uh, some folks around them see what they're doing, and they call, they call the attention to Nebuchadnezzar and say, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, Nebi, everybody else bowed, but they're are three who will not bow. Uh, remember what you said? If they don't bow down, they've got to burn. Nebuchadnezzar gives them an opportunity. For you must know you will always get another opportunity to compromise. Uh, he calls them in and he says, uh, is it true? Uh, did you not hear the music? Uh, maybe your ears are plugged. Uh, maybe the volume wasn't loud enough. Uh, maybe you didn't understand the instructions. So let me give you another opportunity. Uh, you missed your cue to compromise. So I'm going to play the music again. And when I play it, you need to bow down. Uh, in other words, let me come a little bit closer. I'm going to give you another opportunity to compromise. I'm going to remind you your bills are high, but tithe is due. And this time when the offering plate is passed, you need to keep the check in your pocket because you've got to pay your bills. But how many of you know that you don't supply your own needs? God is responsible for supplying all your needs. So he says, let me give you an opportunity. You need to bow down. They said, King, don't waste your time. Ah, I like this. Y'all still with me? He says, King, don't waste your time. We will not be careful. In other words, we will not mince words. We're not even going to hold our breath. Save your song. Let's tell you what we're going to do. We will not bow down because we know you sit on a throne, but there is a king who sits higher and looks down low, and we don't serve you, king. We answer to a higher authority because how many of you know that when you serve God, you will sometimes sign up for trouble. Mm, don't believe me? Come here, Job, and testify. Job can tell you that Job was minding his own business. God and the heavenly council were having a conversation. Here comes the enemy walking by, and God gets his attention and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm walking around looking who I can mess with. And God, not Satan, God, not Lucifer, God says, have you considered my servant Job? Remember Remember, it was not the devil's idea, it was God's idea. Have you ever considered that the trouble you're in, God referred your name to the enemy? That when Satan was looking for somebody to tempt, God pulled your resume, looked through the file, and saw that you were worthy of trial because he needed you to interview for an opportunity to make God known. 
Uh, let me illustrate. I, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was a student at Oakwood College, now Oakwood University, I was the student body president, and I, I was responsible for planning some of the events and, the, and uh, the excursions. So I took my students, we took the students out on whitewater rafting. I don't know if you've ever done that. That's when you go down a, a rapid river. And so I, I said, well, I'm the brave leader. I've got to take my students down the water. But the problem was, ladies and gentlemen, I could not swim. <clears throat> uh, um, but being the brave leader, I had to do that, and so I took them there. And, and I remember they asked me when I went up to the, to the front to pay for all the students, they said, well, can you swim? I said, I cannot. And then they put this piece of paper in front of me. I said, what is this? They said, it is a death waiver. I said, well, what does that mean? They said, well, this means that you must sign this death waiver that says that you are volunteering to go on this journey, and just in case you lose your life, your family does not have the right to sue us for what you voluntarily signed up for. Huh? Let me help you. That whenever you sign up for Christianity, you sign a death waiver, because just in case it doesn't turn out the way you planned your life to be, you will not be able to haul God into the court of your own conscience and hold him guilty for what you volunteered for. Nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me. Do I have any witnesses? So they say, King, we know what the fire can do, but there's one thing we know more than what the fire can do. We know what our God can do. So here's what I like. Here's where we get happy, where they say, uh, we know our God is able. Does anybody here know he's able? We know God is able to put food on the table, but if not, we know God is able to pay all the bills, but if not, we know God is able to bring our wayward children back to the fold, but if not, King, we will not bow down because our praise is not predicated on what God does. Our praise is contingent on who God is, and since he never changes, our praise will never change. But if not, uh, now the enemy gets real mad. And Ellen White describes that the, a demonic spirit now takes over the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar as his face, his face now becomes uh, contorted. He cannot believe that they would make a declaration of faith like this in the face of persecution. But please understand, every Every declaration of faith will demand a declaration of war from the enemy. He will not allow you to talk about how much you love God and not come against you with fierce anger. And so he says, turn up the fire. Do you know the story? Seven times. He says, turn up the fire, because when your faith goes up, the fire goes up. Turn up the fire. They believe and now accept the Sabbath, turn up the fire. They will not bow down to compromise, turn up the fire. And the Bible says they're thrown into the fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar watches as they're supposed to be destroyed. Mm, I said they're supposed to be destroyed. Uh, let me try over here. I said they're supposed to be destroyed, but how many of you know when Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fire, he sees something strange. 
He knows he's thrown in three, but he sees four and they're walking around in the fire. Oh, I like this part. Uh, Mr. President, uh, he's done his arithmetic correctly. He knows he's thrown in three, but why does he see four? And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar says something about making God known. Uh, he says, uh, I thought I threw in three, but I see four, and the fourth one uh, looks like uh, the Son of God. Now, wait, wait, wait just a minute. Uh, now, understand this. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan king. Uh, he's never seen God. So how does he know what God looks like? Uh, here's where I've been trying to get to the whole morning. Uh, because when the saints of God uh, are in the fiery furnace and refuse to give up their faith, uh, people who have never seen God will see God in you. Mm, uh, so that you don't have to invite them to an evangelistic meeting. Why don't you get a pink slip at work, lose your job, and still say hallelujah anyhow? That's the best kind of evangelism because you make God known when you're in the fire and you refuse to give up your faith. Ah, oh, I like this now because they're in the fire and God has not left them. God is with them because how many of you know that your fiery trial attracts God to you? Ah, they're in the fire. But please notice something in the text. It's a part that a lot of people skip over. For it says that the people who threw them in were destroyed at the mouth of the fire. Have you ever thought about that? The intensity of the fire was of such a great place that when those who threw them in, they were destroyed by the fire. So then why was it necessary for King Nebuchadnezzar to bind them before throwing them into the fire. Work with me on this. If the fire was so intense that it killed those who threw them in, why would you go to the trouble of binding them and then throwing them in? Shouldn't the fire destroy them without them being bound? I believe it is a spiritual symbol of a, re of a reality in our lives that before you go into every fiery trial, you go in bound. Mm. You go in bound, for you were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. You go into every trial bound, bound by sinful proclivity and leaning towards iniquity, bound, bound with certain habits and addictions and practices. And here's what the enemy does. He knows your boundness and he says, if I throw them in the right situation, it will act Activate what's already in them and they will lose their faith. But what he did not plan on is God being with you in the fire so that when God gets with you in the fire, he uses what should destroy you to set you free. Oh, you missed it because the fire didn't destroy anything but their chains. So instead of running from the fire, you should thank God for the fire because the devil was an accessory to your deliverance. Because when he turned up the fire, it set you free. He calls them out the fire. Oh, I'm almost through, but are you praising God with me? He calls them out the fire, and, and he does the sniff test. <laughs> he, he's examining their clothes. He goes to the, the parts of their hair, and he realizes that the fire has done them no harm. Why? Because God is such a God that he will not let you look like what you've been through. <laughs> that whatever you've been through, huh? he 
won't let you look like uh, what you've been through. You don't look like you've been sick with cancer. Uh, you don't look like you've been through hell and back because God is able to keep you so you don't look like what you've been through. Oh, but how did they make it through the fire? I'm glad you asked. Uh, I used to pastor down in California, in Southern California, and now in Southern California, even if you look on the news and if you've ever seen the U.S. right now, they've got wildfires in the West because what happens is the Santa Ana winds come down and, and, and the fire, the, the dry brush in the desert catches fire with the dry heat and there are always fires. And I asked a firefighter in my congregation, I said, how do you put out fires. He said, well, here's what we do. He said, as firefighters, we study the nature of fire. We understand where the fire is going. He says, we get to the place where the fire will be. He says, we light fire on purpose. I said, why would you do that? He says, because we've got to light the fire on purpose. It's called a controlled burn. And we light the fire on purpose and burn the place down because of this principle. Fire can't destroy what's already burned. Mm, you get this, huh? So we light it on fire on purpose so that when the raging fire gets there, there's nothing left to burn. Well, when the three Hebrew boys said, but if not, they lit a controlled burn so that when they got to the fiery furnace, there was nothing left to burn. They had given everything to God and God saved them not from the fire but in the fire. And then finally, the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar looks at them this premature praiser who was used to only praising God for what he does and not for who he is, this premature praiser looks at those who have come through the fire who have made God known because you see, remember the context, all the powerful people were there and the thing about God is he will let the devil set the stage but he will take the stage over to make himself known. So Nebuchadnezzar then promotes those who have been through fire because God will only promote those who endure fire. Oh, you missed it, so let me leave you with this. I was down in South Africa preaching revival, my wife and I, last fall, and we were able, we were blessed to go to the, the house there in Soweto where Madiba, where Nelson Mandela once lived. And, and when we went there to the house, which is now a museum, tour guide gave us the tour of the house, told us the riveting stories of what Dr. Mandela went through, and, and he told us one of the stories that after 20 some odd years in prison, he came out and, and after a while he was elected to be the president of South Africa. Uh, they said that uh, in the backstory of that story was that uh, when he was going to prison, the prosecutor, uh, the white prosecutor, uh, said, we ought to hang this man. This man has done terrible things. We ought to hang this man. Well, he went to prison, and when he came out, they were getting ready to elect him as the president. They said, who do you want to swear you in as the president of South Africa? He said, there was a man who was the prosecutor who said I should have been hanged. He said, is he still alive? He, they said, yes. They said, actually, he has ascended to now to being a court judge. He said, bring me the man who said I should have been hanged and make him swear me in. And the man who said he should have been hanged had to hold out the Bible and swear Nelson Mandela in as the president because God will make your haters your elevators and make your enemies your footstool. Is there anybody here who wants to praise God that God will promote you in the fire? And so, the only things you will lose in the fire are the chains that bind you. 
so burn. Let the enemy turn up the fire. You will not bow and you will not burn for God is able. I said God is able. I said God is able to deliver you from the fire but if not he'll glorify himself in the fire. Who wants to have a fireproof faith? Stand to your feet. Here is the word of the Lord to the people of the Lord. Do not run from your greatest opportunity to make God known. Your trial is the greatest context for the glory of God. People need to see that you can suffer just like them, but not worry like them. God can make our faith fireproof. Let's believe that this morning, Father. In the name of Jesus, that one who was with them in the fire that day, the pre-incarnate Christ, who allowed them to not die because of the fiery trial, but live in spite of it. God, we confess this morning that we've often asked you to rescue us from opportunities to glorify you. God, we pray that you will give us such a fireproof faith that we will not bow and we will not bend and know that even if we must burn, we will do so for your glory, knowing that you are able to do anything but fail us. And so God, for the tests that wait for us back at home, for the fiery trials that are awaiting us on our job and in our schools and even in our churches, give us the kind of faith that says, but if not, and use the fire to set us free and glorify your name. For the only reason we live is to make God known. We thank you for this fireproof faith. In the name of Jesus, let all God's children say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you.